Kia ora there. My name's Joseph from Wellington City Libraries. And my name is Juanita. Um, I'm the editor of this particular book here, The Upper Hen and Other Poems by Robin Hyde. For, for those of us who might not know that much about Robin Hyde, can you tell us a bit about her life and her story and where this book fits into it? Oh, right. It's a very big story. So um, she was a Wellington um, girl. She, was, she wasn't born in New Zealand, but she grew up in Wellington. And then she got her first job um, after being dubbed schoolgirl poetess by the Dominion newspaper. Mm -hmm. uh, she went on to become um, an employee of the Dominion. And she worked as a journalist. Um, then she had uh, a lot of other stuff happen to her in life. So for a start, she had uh, um, an operation on her knee, which meant that she was um, um, unable to walk without pain for the rest of her life and subsequently too became addicted to some of the painkilling medicine. Um, she then went on to um, bigger and better things with a column called Peeps at Parliament. Uh, then she actually had an affair with Frederick de Mulford Hyde and became pregnant. And that interrupted her career for a while because she had to go and hide in Australia to have the baby, which was sadly stillborn. Um, the trauma of that affected her for the rest of her life. Uh, she came back and she got back into um, journalism after a, quite a significant breakdown. Um, she then went on to become the lady editor at the Wanganui Chronicle and then she became pregnant again <laughs> and this time she said I'm not going to um, go to Australia I'm going to go to Derville Island <laughs> and hide away from my confinement my pregnancy there um, she got um, basically hounded out of Derville Island when they found out that her ruse of being Mrs Chalice uh, wasn't true and that she was pregnant so the propriety of the time meant that she got kicked out of Derville Island oh. and into Picton where she went to another boarding home and she got kicked out of there when letters were arriving for Iris Wilkinson, Ms. Miss Iris Wilkinson, they realised yeah, she, she wasn't was. married but pregnant so she finally found um, a boarding house where the um, landlord was more interested in the money she was paying than respectability. And so she then had her baby in Picton, and it was the baby she would keep secret for the rest of her life. Nobody knew about him except her good friend and a very few other people, so even her family did not know. Anyway, Derek Chalice was her secret son, and this book here is one that she wrote for him when he was four years old. She was, didn't have a lot of money. She wanted to put something in his Christmas stocking. So she wrote a collection of poetry for him. So that's how it all fits together. <laughs> hey, what was her role in, in, in Derek's life at that time? Was, was she able to spend time with him at all? Or was this book really that bridge between them in a way? Um, well, she started off by um, putting him into a nursing home for two weeks while she tried to find work. Yes. She couldn't find work anywhere. Uh, she was casting about like a vixen whose earths have been stopped up. <laughs> she couldn't find anywhere to, to, um, to work and she couldn't take her baby home. Um, so she was visiting him once a day while trying to get jobs. Mm. Um, eventually she did get an office, offer of a job up in Auckland um, at the Observer, which was a weekly paper, which she basically wrote three quarters of the content every week. Oh. So she was very busy. Um, Derek, meanwhile, was what they called in the old days fostered out, but it's not the same as fostering today. Oh. She basically left him with a woman, paid the woman to look after Derek oh. until she could find a way of bringing him up to Auckland. So that was really um, traumatic for her to leave him behind. 
and then when he finally, when she finally brought him up to Auckland, she found another family where he could go and live. Yeah. So she wasn't seeing him all the time um, at that stage, but um, she was never going to give him up for adoption. Mm. She had absolutely no support from anyone. Um, she had um, an employer who was extremely um, keen for her to work harder and put in more stories every week. Um, she had nobody to talk to, nobody in support uh, in Auckland at all. She did have a correspondence with John Schroeder, who was an editor of the literary pages of a newspaper in Christchurch. Mm. Um, and she had lots of letters with her good friend Gwen. Mm. But besides that, no support, no help. Nobody to even talk about how she was going to care for her son, mm. let alone rejoice in his birth. And so oh. yeah, she was a woman alone. So now that we have a little bit of context for when this book was written, how does it fit into her, her overall bibliography, like her right. works? How does it fit in there? Well, it's a big thing right now because you know it took nearly 90 years to get published. But in terms of her work, this is just a very small collection. She wrote over um, a thousand poems. Mm. Um, she's had um, a whole anthology of, sorry, yes, a whole anthology of her poetry was published um, called Young Knowledge and um, by Michelle Leggett, New Zealand's first poet laureate. And they were hand selected and chosen for that book. So that's a huge collection of poetry. Mm. Um, then she's got 10 novels, and she's got masses of, um, of journalists, investigative reports and journalism and columns and uh, letters. There's a huge body of work. So in terms of the huge body of work, this is just one very sweet little collection that she wrote for a little boy. Did, did you know Derek personally? Yes. yes. Um, I found Derek because a lot of people have always said, I wonder what happened to the little, the, whatever happened to the boy? Mm. Because she died when he was um, yeah. eight years old, and then the people that were fostering him both died within a year. Oh. And then he was sent to an orphanage. Yeah. And he again, he had no support, he had no family, nobody to look after him. So off he went to a, mm. an orphanage. And then, you know, he went into the Navy when he was 15. And then he educated himself um, after he got out. Then he went to university. Mm. And then he went on to teach. And he went on to be a um, scientist mm. and a boat builder and an art collector and a music lover and a family man and a husband. And he went on to this wonderful life. And then he spent a good portion of his time writing the definitive biography of his mother mm. with another woman called Gloria Rollinson mm. and they wrote the book of Iris and I, when I read that I just I just said I've got to find out who he is so I actually made contact with him age 90 a couple mm. of years ago um, but um, after I made the documentary we became friends yeah is that around the time when this collection as it was originally published, surfaced? Were you aware no, of I was. Before? I was going to, you know, Cuba Press. Thank goodness, stepped in and published it in beautiful form. But I was going to do a very amateur self-publish mm. and have it put like his mother did. She wrote on. She wrote on the cover of it. I hope to have this published one day with funny little pictures. Mm. And so I thought it would be a really super idea to pub self-publish it myself and put it in his stocking as a surprise. Mm. But unfortunately, um, he got ill and so he never saw it. I told him about it, mm. uh, that it was going to be a, a surprise for him. His wife, Lynn Chalice, has seen the book and she loves it. Mm. And she said that he would have been very happy with it. So that is um, a marvellous result because really it's for him that mm. the book is published. Um, and the sadness is that he's not here, but you know, it's a, it's a wonderful book for New Zealanders to mm. enjoy. And I've noticed that a lot of the people that are buying this book are sending it overseas to oh, Kiwis cute. who've got little <laughs> ones overseas. I think you've absolutely nailed it with um, 
fulfilling Iris's wish around having the funny illustrations. Oh, thank you. Um, so how did you sort of come come into contact with and select uh, Dean as the illustrator? I really like some of Dean's illustrations, how they'll have some really quite classical illustration, children's illustration elements that feel like a callback more to oh, around the time that it was probably written. Yeah. And then there's also those kind of more recent or very identifiably Aotearoa elements like on one yeah. page I think yeah. I saw red band gumboots yes, and these that's sorts right. of things that's right. um, so how did you find and select Dean as being the right illustrator for this book well she had a little portfolio in a art um, illustrators um, association uh, and when I saw the humour that she could portray I knew that she would be perfect and she was. She was perfect for the job um, because she understood that it had to feel old worldy, mm. but it had to have that modern element. Mm. The sets that are in it are incredibly descriptive for the poem. So if the poems are a little bit hard to, to understand, the pictures draw the child mm. in and, and the illustrations, I think, are really good. Um, the interesting thing about her as an illustrator is that she did it all on really large manuscript card. Mm. She did it with um, a variety of mediums mm -hmm. and if you see the originals they're just so rich and mm. so warm and so textured. I think the illustrations she's provided will have exceeded Robin Hyde's mm. you know, first idea. So to you, are there any of these poems that have a really strongly autobiographical element about about Iris, about Robin's life story? It's very interesting you bring that up because I've often noted in these poems, they can be read many ways, they can be read many times, people can get different symbols and imagery from them. Uh, there are a few res um, references to sort of classical Greek and, mm. um, and uh, Roman sort of gods. There, there are a number of ways that they can be read. One mm. of them, obviously, is the rhythm, the rhyme, and the mm. cute story for the child. But then there's another whole level, which is for adults, and you can read into that um, a little bit of uh, the hardships and the life that Iris Wilkinson had to live. So there are times, I mean, I've said it before, but one of my favourites is the Starlings. Mm. It almost makes me cry at the end mm. because she actually talks about the strange human city. Mm. Now that is a theme that was solid for her, it was a real theme for her because she was unconventional. She was um, living a life which didn't have the respectability mm. of the time. So she was always at odds. Mm. She was a woman ahead of her time. Mm. And so for her, she could see a much better world. It's, um, been, she has described her, her, her life as being caught in the hinge of mm. an opening door between one age and another, Oof. the respectable mm. and the new age. And mm. so you, when you know that, you can kind of pick it up in some of the poems. Um, there are um, m many different ways of reading the wall. There is another way of reading it. But I was just a child and I came back to save you. There are so many lines in her poetry which mm. could be taken another way. Um, even the uppish hen mm. could be seen that the uppish hen is basically a feminist. I'm not just going to put out eggs every day mm. the way all these other women are. I'm going to do it my way. Whereas the duck is quite happy just to plod along and give a day a neighbor day. So, you know, mm. as I say, there are many ways you can read it. And mm. so it's very interesting for, for a, um, an adult to read these poems to a child because as many times as you read them and the child will love the words and mm. um, lilts and the rhythm. But I think an adult can get a lot out of it as well. Mm. Yeah, I remember, was it the philosophy of Winnie the Pooh? Mm. You know, there could be 
an equally interesting book, The Biographical Details of mm. Iris Wilkinson and Her Poem. She had this um, philosophy that people really wanted to get, you know, we were in a small country. England was a place that people really wanted to get to. New Zealanders really wanted to travel mm. there. So she came up with the Godwits Fly, which is basically, um, you know, overseas experience, OE, as mm. it is now. And so she was the person who kind of first invented OE mm. um, because she sort of, it's kind of the restless spirit of New Zealanders mm. who want to go somewhere. Um, and basically, that restless spirit was in her all along, although the main reason that she went, because she had to leave her son, the main reason she went is because she hoped that being in England would, well, she could meet her publishers for the first time, mm. she could write some more books and get better coverage. Mm. Um, there are very few reviews back in New Zealand of her books. Um, you know, there were more reviews of her book in New York. I mean, mm. when she died, there was an obituary in, in the New York Times um, uh, because of her book, Dragon Rampant. Um, mm. So anyway, she left New Zealand, not just because of the restless spirit to go somewhere, but also so that she could make a, some money and she could come back and she could buy a little house in the woods for her and her son. Her horizons were huge. Mm. They were very international. Because well, one of the poems is about a, a shepherd in China, and she spent time there as well, well right? Yes, she did. Now, that poem is basically old-fashioned enough that not many people will realize it, but people used to put little China figurines on their wall, on their oh. bookshelves, or oh. on their mantelpiece. Right. And they were called China China figurines, and there were several really big brands, oh. and people would have Ladra from Spain, or they would have, yeah. I can't remember them all, yeah. because um, I thought they were quite cute, but I, I wasn't about to have any myself for yeah. my own decor, but um, that was part of the decor when Robin Hyde, or when oh, Iris was little. Okay. So she would have seen a lot of China shepherds, mm. or a lot of China dancing dolls, or um, trying to think what other Chinese, China, little China figurines that you would get, mm. um, and, but they weren't from China necessarily. Yes, right. Yeah. So uh, this poor little China shepherd, he's caught, he's cast, he's China, he can't move, and everything oh. else is around him having this fabulous time, but yeah. he's just got to be a shepherd all day, he can't leave his pedestal. Mm. So it's quite a it's quite a sweet little poem about yeah. him, and in there, you know, Dean has drawn a, one of the users sitting there knitting, mm. and it's cute because obviously knitting the wool from her own body. Mm. <laughs> it's, you know, there's quite a few little um, mm. lovely little pictures associated with that one. But yes, now on the other hand, she did go to China. It was an impulsive decision made because she really cared about getting the story of war and what was happening mm. with the Japanese invasion um, in 1939, or 38, mm -hmm. um, when she was um, in China. She wasn't intending to go there, but she went to China and she um, in, um, chased down Chiang Kai-shek to get a, a permit so she could go behind the lines where nobody else was allowed to go. She was definitely the first female mm. um, war correspondent to do so in the world, um, and she went behind the lines, and not long after she started reporting from there, um, the invasion actually took the city that she was in, mm. and so then she had to try and escape, and she had um, incredible, I don't know if you would call them adventures, but she had mm. incredible series of things happen to her before she could get out again. And mm. then she wrote about her experiences um, for newspapers and journals, and then a book called Dragon Rampant. Hmm. So, so that's her Chinese. Right, right. Which connection contributed to her legacy in the in New York Times, as you mentioned. With yes, her yes. And the book would have done incredibly well, except that World War Two was about to eclipse hmm. the Sino-Japanese War, hmm. and she had the um, prescience to re figure out that 
the Japanese were just going to keep on mm. invading and they wouldn't stop with China. And so she really wanted to um, you know, publicize what was happening. I mean, she saw, it, I can't actually mention to you all the things she saw because it's so traumatic, mm. the things that she saw. I mean, she had to uh, try and help, even though she was supposed to be a war correspondent, she was actually helping to look after a lot of the patients. At one stage, she had to flick maggots out of wounds and mm. stomp on them with her shoe. Continuing that, that theme of her legacy, authors in Aotearoa may have to go overseas to be recognised, you know, achieve success abroad before they might be recognised in their own country. Did, right. Do you think that was the case with her? Or do you well, think yes, she, I yeah. mean, there were, um, you know, there were windows in bookshops with her book as the prime mm. book. Um, but back in New Zealand, I don't even know she got a review on Dragon Rampant. Hmm. Not even sure. However, there was a lot of difficulty for a woman uh, writer in those days. Hmm. I mean, the Caxton Press were um, incredibly, um, I don't want to say misogynistic, but they were very anti-woman. Hmm. They described um, woman writers as bores in stuffy drawers and the minstrel school of poetry and um, they weren't about to just publish um, her, her work. Um, mind you, it was normal in those days for people to go to London for book publications. Mm. Um, but um, after she died, um, one of the few people that wanted to champion her work um, met with a, a barrier and she couldn't get some of, she couldn't do any posthumous publishing of um, Robin Hyde's work, so it was, it was a bit of a challenge. You know, some of the influential writers of the time, although they admired Robin Hyde, because they've all written um, at different times for uh, things that, that she has got a very um, a, a luminous style of writing. Mm. I mean, there are a lot of great things said about her writing, but for some reason it was very hard for her mm. to get reviews to get published um, in in New Zealand yeah does that does that mean that her legacy has even fully developed at this point has is there still places for it to go is it still a growing ascending star I like to think so Joseph Mm. I like to think so because I think um, the more people that hear about her and exposed to her work are, are just I'm startled that nobody has ever mentioned or that she's not a household name that you know people talk about Catherine Mansfield people Mm. talk about Janet Frame but very few people um, have talked about Robin Hyde or Iris Wilkinson and then as soon as they get exposed and they start reading the power of her writing and the realism Mm. and the uh, I've heard it described as visceral you, you can't help but actually say, my goodness, yeah. you know, this is a wonderful writer. And, um, and then you look at her life and you think, ah, ah, mm. so that's why mm. um, she didn't sort of become as famous as the others. Mm. Yeah. Mm. It was kind of, it was kind of the culture of the day, you know, she, uh, she didn't win in that culture. <laughs> yeah. That quote about being the hinge between... Yes, caught in the hinge. The, yeah, that is, mm. seems very, very apt. Mm. She seems to have That's remarkable right. insight into both herself and the times that she lived in. Yes, that's right. And I think, really, that um, she would have been such a different person today for a start, she wouldn't have had this operation, which basically m- meant that she couldn't walk without a stick. She wouldn't have had to keep her baby secret. She would have been paid, you know, she did twice, it's not a cliche, she did twice the work for half the pay of men. Um, she was never promoted. Um, she wasn't given the opportunities of men. And in fact, you know, when she first had little Derek, she couldn't even get a job. 
and some of the publishers, uh, some of the newspapers were saying to her, start a new career lady, there's no job for you around here. <laughs> so um, had she lived today, she would have at least been a syndicated journalist. Hmm. Yeah. So, and an acclaimed writer in her own lifetime. Hi. <laughs> oh, oh, and so. And she could have lived with a son. Yeah. Mm. I guess all we can do is, is share that legacy and share those stories and the prolific output that she was able to create. That's right. Given all of the barriers and resistance that she faced. So I'm personally looking forward to exploring some of her, yeah, her adult good. work now. Oh, this that's is right. And a very nice introduction that I've had through through the work you've edited here. Yeah. Thank you. That's good. Thank you.